All right, everybody. Welcome to the fifth Apache Beam uh, Summit. Um, it's an uh, exciting time. Uh, it's our second uh, digital one. Um, hopefully our last and we can afterwards go back to real in-person events or mixed events. No promises though. But um, we're excited to bring you kind of three days of awesome uh, content from the community. Um, we're going to open this keynote with some uh, some stats, some why would you use Beam, some, some history, uh, what's going on in the community, and what's the state of uh, Beam today, and where is it going? And we'll get some uh, pointers at the end uh, of how you can get involved. So it's kind of strange to probably start this conference with why you should Apache Beam. Hopefully most of you know, but let's just dive into it. Um, most of you are here because you probably have one kind of data processing um, problem. Um, lots of people start with it. They have some, some interesting solutions to to, to crack like uh, an ML problem or just uh, standard calculating some stuff. In general, you start small. Um, most of the, uh, the data pipelines that are, are there are now kind of batch, but if you look at the problems at the problem state, most of them are actually stream. Um, so you, you see what, what's, what is the user doing on my website? Is he, is he doing some sales? Is it buying what I expect them to do? Uh, so you start up with this kind of streaming, streaming, streaming pipeline. You capture all the events. He, he viewed that product. He viewed that page. He, he went to the cart. He didn't finish. Why or something? So start with a simple problem, a computational problem. You just compute some statistics out of that, and it's fine in the beginning. But then your website kind of grows, and then you get like so much data uh, that that you start having to have the problem of damn, that's too much to actually handle streaming on one on computer. How do I split it up? Um, do I need to split it up? And how do I do that technically? So that's that could be kind of a hard problem to crack because yeah, you have that data. Uh, how do you, what goes to what computer? So how do we split it up? Um, those are problems that, that are on a technical level kind of hard to solve, solve. But you, do, but you as kind of a business user, you, you don't want to actually think about those things. You only have a problem that, that is easily defined. I just want to have a count of those things. Uh, that is in my, my data stream. I don't want to think about kind of how do you distribute that. And how oh, damn, all, all the, after a while you get like mobile, you get like other kind of devices. Uh, mobile certainly, uh, people are offline, they have bad connectivity, data comes in late. How do you handle this? So um, what, what do I do if I do kind of, uh, I want to have the, count of everything in that hour, but the data is getting late. Uh, there's a, all kind of things you do not, as kind of a business user, want to think about. Um, and and what, what about the problem if you have like, okay, now I'm streaming, but after a while, my business requirements change, and maybe I want to get some, some stuff, more stuff out of my data. You want to reprocess everything. You don't want to write other kind of pipelines out of it. You just want, again, just describe my problem, add those things to what I want, define it, and just to rearrange those things and batch. You don't want to write, take another product out of it because handling the conceptually streaming is kind of different than handling those things and batch. So what you want is kind of think about, I just want to count this, I want to join it with that and that and describe that in a kind of an easy manner. If you have those uh, problems, Beam is, Beam is here to help. You, you will probably uh, are uh, much more familiar with uh, 
with kind of other products that are out there, um, like uh, Spark uh, and Flink. They're they're very popular, but there are a lot of other products out of out of on the mark, like S Storm and Sansa, and they all solve kind of a similar problem, but they all have their strengths and their weaknesses. Some are more tailored towards streaming processing. Some are more tailored towards um, uh, batch processing, and they all have kind of another API. Where Beam comes in is actually you you describe your your problem more on an abstract level, and then pick the best product for running your job. So maybe if you have like a very batch kind of process, you maybe can even get away with Hadoop. Probably nobody does that anymore. But if you then go to to more stream, if you have a streaming problem without with with the same kind of code, you can run that on, on Flink. That is that is better better for streaming or or some other product that's out there. Or if you're on Google Cloud, for example, you could take Cloud Data Flow. Um, and so on for other kind of cloud providers, they they could have like uh, products that run Beam natively or on a product that, that they're hosting. So Beam is actually abstracting a lot of those those uh, those renders, but they are really leveraging them. That. So what you do is like the Beam vision is you describe. I want to have the sum per key. Describe that in an easy way. Not in one language. In the beginning, it was kind of only kind of Java. But the Beam vision is that you describe your problem in the nat in the in the language that you're comfortable with. Um, a lot of data processing and certainly machine learning people are way more comfortable with Python. So they probably will uh, take Python if they want to describe uh, their problem. And then you can now also go go with Go. Um, or even like SQL, a lot of business-oriented people that are, that are not data scientists are way more knowledgeable in SQL. Uh, maybe you can describe your problem like that. We will translate that kind of in a general model, and then it's up to you, your data engineers, to pick kind of the correct runner that is appropriate for your technique, for your technique, or or what is best for your cloud provider or your on-prem installation, for example. So Beam will kind of give you the best of, of, of all kind of worlds. Um, pick the language that you want and pick the runner that you have. You just have to focus not on how you do it, but on the what. So that's what we, where we're at. So. Uh, you will have like lots of talk that go into detail how you can do those things uh, during this the summit. But um, if you want to use Beam, this is like the the best choice. Well, what you can, if you have a problem, go to Beam. You can pick the best tools for the for the job. So Beam is now at its fifth year since its kind of start in the, the Apache Software Foundation as an incubation project. It's like uh, our fifth anniversary. Um, so in 20, 2016, Beam was created. Um, and at its first release, uh, quickly a lot of uh, new things, new features uh, came, came added. Uh, certainly in the year after with 20 connectors, and it was really an interesting time because you you suddenly had like lots of inputs and outputs where you can can write to you can write from files and outputs to to storage storage or um, or to databases. And quickly uh, uh, the year after, we get like our first uh, first Beam Summit uh, in London. Uh, yay! So the first Beam Summit. Uh, still in a real person, not with a lot of people, but with a lot of ambience and a lot of interesting, uh, interesting topics. And the same year, where uh, where uh, Apache Beam was the top ASF project. Um, I don't know if it's 
still the top one. I think it's still still high, but that you will see that later in the, into the slides in the, in the updates. Um, since then, we had like well, it's our fifth, so we had like a second one in the US, uh, a, a second one, uh, the, the third one again in Europe. Quickly, quickly after that. But then, for one reason or another, in 2020, we, we needed to switch to to the digital format. Um, it was kind of a, a hard year because a lot of us kind of live for those in-person events, like talking to the hallway. But uh, but at least we got some some interesting con content uh, content. And this year, well, it's the second digital one. So. And with that, um, I'm going to give give the it over to Matthias that goes a bit deeper into the community and what's happening there. Thank you very much, Alex, for the overview of the history and the, the great technical intro. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, good to have you back at Beam Summit 2021. Um, as you might know, I'm Matthias. Um, I've been involved with Beam Summit for quite some time now as well. And today I'll be going through how the project is doing from a community point of view, illustrating where we are um, using a, a few data points along the way. Um, next slide, please, Alex. Awesome. Um, so yeah, let's get started uh, with the driving force uh, behind the majority of large software projects, which is the amount of tickets filed and solved throughout time. As you can see, also for Beam, this number has been steadily growing, uh, which, which kind of means bugs were filed and features were requested. But at the same time, the team behind Beam has been working hard writing code to address these tickets. And it looks to me that particularly May and June were productive months this year. And I was wondering if it had to do something with the world kind of reopening after COVID-19. So maybe there's some um, good productivity coming from that in the end. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Um, yeah, anyway, um, as everybody knows, uh, the driving force behind all this progress um, are actual human beings. Um, without them, this red line would go through the roof, but the green one would kind of remain static. And that's why it makes sense to take a look, look at the number of contributors to the project. And honestly, I was quite surprised and quite happy to see that even during the past year, which in my opinion, hasn't been the best in a few, at least a few respects. We were still able to onboard um, almost 150 new contributors to the project. Next slide, please. Um, and the good news is that we uh, can see a similar growing trend in the number of recognized committers to the project, this project as well, which is also obviously great news. Um, so looking at the behavior of um, these contributors throughout time. Um, as people might already know, the, the new Beam version gets released on a six week cadence, which is kind of reflected in this graph. And as we can see, we have a lot of, um, a lot of repeat contributors between two releases. On average, we add about 20 new contributors in each, in each new release. Um, and obviously, uh, since the amount, um, Obviously, since the total amount approximately stays, stays the same throughout time, we have a few people dropping off each time as well, which is it's totally normal. Um, next one. So diving a little bit deeper, uh, we see a similar trend when we look at the number of commits per contributor. Um, our community obviously has a few heavyweights that spend a lot of their time in the project, as we can see on the left-hand side. Um, but there's also a large number of smaller committers or even one-time committers. Next one. Um, if we dive into this tail end, uh, we can actually see that trend being confirmed. Um, we can see a large number of contributors that only have a few uh, commits in the project. Um, moving a bit away a bit from the code and looking more at the social interactions in the project, we have seen a lot of traffic on both mailing lists again this year. Um, as you were saying, Alex, um, we were the top five um, in the dev mailing list across the Apache Foundation in the year 2020, which is which is super awesome. 
And I encourage everyone to keep these discussions going in the coming months and years, obviously. Um, next one. So looking from a more qualitative point of view, point of view, um, we can see a large number um, of large organizations that have been actively using and or contributing to Beam, um, a few of which are listed here. And we are really eagerly awaiting for you and your company to join that list. Um, but Austin will actually talk a bit more about that later. Next one. Um, yeah, this is my favorite slide, actually. Um, this is about the people that we were able to welcome um, to the list of committers and PMC members. And having been on this list myself a few years ago and knowing some of these people personally, this, this gives me a, really a lot of joy. Um, I wish we could celebrate this moment in real life, but who knows, maybe we, we can make it happen next year. Um, for now, big, big congratulations to everyone on, on this list. And with those celebratory remarks, I would like to pass the stage to Brittany, who has done a really great job coordinating this year's Beam Summit, and who will talk a bit about the past and upcoming events and different ways to stay in touch with the Beam community. Take it away, Brittany. Thank you, Matthias, for giving that great talk. Um, it's been amazing to see the community grow. Hi, everyone. I'm Brittany, and I've been focusing um, specifically on the social media and event management um, for Apache Beam with this team, who has been great. Um, and today I wanted to give first an update on our events. So even though this year wasn't the in-person event like we had hoped due to COVID-19, that didn't stop our team from working hard to reach this intended audience. We've had over 1,500 registrations for the Beam Summit 2021 from all around the world with North America, Europe, and Asia being our leading countries in registrations. In regards to the content, we've had 27, we have 27 hours of content ready for you guys today, including five workshops from 38 incredible speakers, all ranging from beginning to advanced topics. Earlier this year, we also hosted our Beam College, which was the first large scale training produced for Apache Beam. It was an outstanding event with over 1300 registrations from 86 countries, 860 unique live viewers, and a total reach of 80,000 um, practitioners throughout the demand sessions. Our, all of our attendees included developers, data scientists, and data architects and almost 50% of the registered participants had no previous experience from Apache Beam, which was incredible to see what they were able to take away from the event. In addition to those two large events, we also hosted a Beam Learning Month earlier this year in an English version, and we are planning to host a Spanish edition in October. We also have hosted a few Europe-based meetups and plan to expand the meetup programs and frequency throughout the world in the upcoming year. For those of you based in London, we have some exciting news that in mid to late September, we are planning to host the 2021 Beam London Meetup. If you're interested in being a speaker for any of these events, please feel free to reach out to myself or one of the other Beam event organizers. Next, I'd like to talk about our social media and ways that you can engage with the community. First, we have our YouTube channel where all of our recordings from all of our events are hosted. This is also the place where you will find content from this year's Beam Summit. I do encourage you to check it out and subscribe to the link above to help us continue to grow this incredible Beam community. A good way, as always, to stay in the know about the Beam Summit and about our project is through the event's Twitter handle and the Apache Beam Twitter handle. This is where you can follow for updates and announcements from the Beam experts. We also have a LinkedIn page where you'll find announcements and updates regarding the Beam Summit. So go ahead and follow us to stay in the know throughout our events. And the best way to get involved, especially during this upcoming week, is to join our Slack channel. I encourage you all to introduce yourselves, ask questions, and engage with the community. We also have our Beam website that was just revamped. And since, we've had an impressive amount of growth of users visiting our site. 
Please be sure to check it out where you, where you will find Powered by Apache Beam use cases, documentation, and learn more about ways that you can contribute. Next, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Pablo, where he will talk about Beam status today. Hi, everyone. I uh, had just been informed that I was muted. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm Pablo. Uh, I've been involved in Beam for almost five years now. And uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk to you about um, where Beam is today and what has happened in the last year since the previous summit. Uh, and after that, I'll also talk to you about some, you know, I'll. I'll I'll brainstorm with you about what are some things that uh, could come to Beam in the future. Can we go to the next slide, please? All right, so here's here's a, a little timeline of more or less the last uh, five years in Beam and what are some of the big interesting features. Um, in the last year, uh, we, we had some interesting additions. Uh, we had data frames in 2020, and now data frames is, is becoming even more full featured. Uh, so that's very cool. We're also we also have people in the community that have worked to improve uh, multi language pipelines so that they're easier to use. And we have now more transforms that are available as multi language pipelines. Um, <clears throat> something very cool that happened uh, in the last few months is uh, we finalized uh, splittable Dufon. So splittable Dufon was a uh, source framework that we that we had uh, on the works for a while, um, and so we we were finally able to kind of publish a, a definitive API for Splitable Dufon on on Go, Python, and Java as the case. We also have support for Spark three on some of our runners, uh, and we have a Dataflow v two, so it's an, a new version of Dataflow. We also added support for Java eleven, final official support for Java eleven. And we stopped supporting Python 2, so uh, we, we stopped publishing Python 2 binaries, and, and we are uh, fully on Python 3. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so what's, uh, what's cool about some of this, uh, these new things is our portability framework, which had also been in the works for a while. It's, uh, it's very mature now, so we've gone through, um, through the cycle of optimizing it and finding inefficiencies and uh, make use establishing a baseline that can be used in production. Um, something cool about having this more mature portability framework is that it enables other features like custom containers. So now we can we are publishing containers with uh, with the basic SDK images, and users can uh, build on top of these containers to to add their own dependencies, and uh, which is much easier than what we had before, where we, um, you know, users had to pass special parameters or do do some scripting on startup of workers to to include uh, unusual dependencies. Uh, we're also we also have improved cross language transforms thanks to a mature portability framework. Uh, and yes, as as Brittany mentioned earlier, we we also have an improved website this year. Um, so that's all. Those are all very very cool things that have happened in the last year. Um, I encourage you all to go look at the documentation, see what's new with uh, with the new SDF API, and uh, and yeah, try try all of these new features. Also, see the website. Uh, next slide, please. Um, all right, and so this is now in this section. I wanted to talk about what are some things that could come to Beam tomorrow and. This is, by the way, I'm no one's boss. Uh, I'm a member of the community, and this, the things that happen in Beam uh, are, are done by the community. And so these are all things that are interesting and that uh, there are some people working on uh, for some of them and some other things that uh, could be useful for users. So um, for starters, uh, there is some work happening in 
you know, in this few features. Um, we have, uh, there's a number of community members working on finalizing Go SDK and making sure that it's fully supported for uh, all our portable runners. Um, there's been uh, work to add uh, transform hints, so to tag transforms with uh, perhaps uh, their, their expected behavior, like high fan out or their requirements for, uh, for hardware, et cetera. Um, there's been people that, has, that work on, on the SQL side of Beam uh, trying to integrate with, uh, with Metastore so that uh, whenever we're, we're working with Beam SQL or just with Beam in general, we can uh, obtain metadata about our, our P collections and our sources uh, from, from a Metastore, which, which would make using Beam much easier. Um, something that we're also thinking about is, uh, you know, how do we implement uh, retractions properly? How um, how do we how do we work with syncs that support retractions and don't support retractions? How do we implement this in in runners? Um, something else that is uh, that members of the community are considering is how do we how do we improve our our utility functions? How do we make it easier for users to uh, to just use Beam without having to to code crazy uh, do funds that do uh, do complex functionality, right? So, for instance, stream joins uh, is something that that members of the community are working to to write utility functions for, um, or, or time series. Um, next slide. Now, if we <clears throat> if we want to think big, uh, we can you know we can brainstorm about some interesting things that could be added to Beam, right? Uh, something that um, I've, I've been wondering about for a while is uh, a lot of a lot of our runners support uh, iterative computations, right? So you can you can run um, graph algorithms, you can run uh, gradient descent type computations in these runners, but you can't do that in Beam yet because the because the API doesn't support it. So uh, maybe it's worth thinking: how do we how do we um, define uh, an API that allows us to do iterative computation in Beam. <coughs> Something else is complex event processing, right? So <coughs> for users today, if they want to do pattern matching on streams, they need to code uh, some complex stateful do funds. Uh, how do we, maybe we, we want a, a utility API that can, uh, you know, Make this seamless, and so where a user can just specify the the pattern or the set of events instead of having to code a, a procedural complex do fund that will uh, that will check for them, right? Maybe you want a, a new a new language SDK. Um, that's something also that I've thought about, right? So what's um, what is a, an interesting community that uh, would be worth working with, uh, and uh, you know enabling them to, to work with Beam. Uh, perhaps C-sharp, that's, that's one of the top of mind, uh, but perhaps Ruby or something else. <coughs> and <coughs> something else is currently Beam uh, provides kind of the top level API, but maybe it would be good for Beam to, you know, to help also on the, on the operation side, right? How do we, how do, does Beam help uh, its users manage uh, snapshots and state for, you know, for various runners. Um, so those are those are all interesting questions that uh, are worth thinking for for the community uh, over over the, the next few months and years. Um, next slide. I picked a few um, very uh, a, a few significant items that um, I, I know people are thinking about and that would be. Um, would be very useful. Um, one of them is uh, how how do we bring some relational concepts into Beam, right? So we already have Beam schemas where uh, where P collections have uh, uh, information about the data that they're encoding. Uh, they allow us to do uh, you know compile time checking of many things. Uh, well, not compile time, but pipeline construction time checking of of, of many things, uh, and we also they also allow us to um, to integrate with sources and syncs, right? So there's a couple sources and syncs today that integrate well with uh, with schemas, where um, 
you don't really need to specify a format function on how you want to format your data to go into, let's say, BigQuery or you know JDBC. You just pass it a P collection with a schema, and and you know we'll take that P collection with a schema and write it to your to the sync uh, easily. But what if you know if we have a lot more information about schemas and a lot uh, and we we could be much smarter in at pipeline construction time, right? So, for instance. Uh, can we do columnar optimizations? Can we say, uh, given this pipeline, we know that we only need a few of the columns from from our rows. So, how uh, do we need to encode all rows? No, right. So we can make this optimization where we don't serialize all of the data. Um, perhaps we can reorder operations, right? Which is something that Beam cannot do today because Beam doesn't have a lot of information about what the transforms are doing within them, right? But maybe. Uh, maybe if we if we know information about the schema and about the operation inside a transform, we can say, okay, well, we're performing a filter here that we could perform much earlier and uh, save a lot of a lot of serialization, right? <clears throat> this would also, you know, increasing kind of the power of schemas and the the scope of schemas can also help us uh, make the pipeline, you know, just work, right? So uh, a lot of time when writing a Beam pipeline is spent. Uh, figuring out what coder to use, figuring out, okay, how are we going to format this data to fit into the sync? How are we going to format this data that comes from this source? How are we going to format this data to, you know, match what this other transform needs? Um, <clears throat> but, you know, if we um, if we expand the scope of schemas and we, we try to bring in uh, relational concepts, we can also uh, build towards uh, a Beam SDK that just works, right? Um, so that's 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 a cool area of uh, of work and worth thinking about. Can we go to the next slide? Um, something else that I that I have thought about myself is uh, dynamic schemas. So um, today, when when the schema in one of your P collection changes, uh, what you what we what we tell users is well. You just need to update your pipeline, right? Re re snapshot your pipeline and, and start a new one uh, with the new with the new coders defined, right? <clears throat> um, and so this is this this works well, but adds some operational complexity, right? You you need to um, you need to decide when you want to restart your pipeline. You need to be very careful about when you change your your schemas. Um, how do we? So so a question that I've asked myself. Of over the last few months is uh, how how do we enable uh, pipelines to have schemas that evolve over time without having to to make the user update the pipeline or snapshot and restart the pipeline? Um, and then you know I've, we've also done some work on on CDC, so capturing changes from from databases, and and in in this in these pipelines we have data coming from multiple tables, right? And so does it make sense to to have a single pipeline that can handle data from multiple tables and thus has multiple schemas, uh, and so yeah, that's um, that's something that I've thought about recently and that I think would be very useful for Beam because it would help us to simplify operation of pipelines and uh, allow users to just start their pipeline and forget about it as long as all of the the schema infrastructure is is set up. Um, next slide, please. Oh. Yeah, um, <clears throat> something else that um, I haven't spent much time thinking about, but I've heard here and there from from different people in the communities. Um, maybe I don't want to I don't want to keep running a, a, a streaming pipeline twenty four seven, um, but I also don't want to run one huge batch pipeline every day, right? Maybe I can run a batch pipeline every five minutes. And um, how how can we help users that have this need? To perhaps manage their their snapshots or or the state for for previous runs of their pipelines, right? How do we uh, how does Beam add utilities to to help them restart their pipelines easily? How and uh, manage handle errors? Um, so that's that's another interesting uh, area of work that uh, that we could pursue. Um, next slide. Um, something else that. Uh, that would be very cool is usability improvements, right? So there's been lots of work on, on data frames uh, and 
they recently are, uh, are going to kind of GA level, a feature that, that it's fully supported. Um, <clears throat> what, uh, something that members of the community are thinking about is, okay, how do we, the work that we've done for interactive beam and the work that we've done, we've done with data frames, how do we make them work together and uh, make it useful for users uh, that are perhaps using notebooks to, to build their big data pipelines, right? Um, and something even simpler is um, because of the design of Beam, uh, it's a little different uh, to use than how people normally use uh, these data analytics frameworks like Pandas or Spark, um, where people can just have their, their collection, they, uh, they press the dot and they, they autocomplete uh, will help them find the next transform that they want to use, right? Um, so, wouldn't it be cool if Beam had a better auto-completion where users don't need to go and dive into documentation to find which are the utility transforms that they can use? Um, so that's that's something else that we we could uh, we could look into, right? So add-ons for IDEs or for or for notebooks uh, that would be also very cool. Um, yeah, but so anyway, uh, this is as I said earlier. Um, I'm not anyone's boss, and Beam is built by a community. And so what we appreciate most is your feedback. So does any of these ideas, do, do they make sense? Uh, do they not? Do they, do they sound crazy? Um, please tell us what are some features that you would like? What are some pain points that you have? Uh, we have the user mailing list and the dev mailing list. Now, if those are a little intimidating, you can email me directly. You can email other members of the community directly. You can look at the repository and see who changes certain areas of the code and email them. Uh, people will be happy to, to talk to you and, and hear what, what are, what are your, your concerns and your interests. Um, <clears throat> now, some, something, uh, something funny, whenever I, I meet with, uh, with Beam users, what I end up telling them a lot is, uh, why don't you contribute? So, um, if you if you have a feature that you would like, yes, talk to us. But also, if you want, uh, propose the design, propose the idea, uh, write the feature if you would like. Um, those that would be amazing, and uh, we we will all be happy to support you in uh, uh, improving your design, reviewing your 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 pull requests, bringing it in to the release, and making sure that it's part of the. Um, Right, and that's uh, that's it for me. Uh, the <clears throat> I'll pass it on to to Austin to to tell us how to get involved and, and wrap it up. Great, that um, <coughs> that's a nice segue too, because uh, some of those pointers we're gonna repeat again here, um, which I think is um, you know bears even worth repeating. So. Um, uh, to summarize right there's a ton of I mean get involved by just following the various activities and um, you know share here right Brittany talked about the Twitter and the YouTube channels um, we have uh, you know ASF Apache Software Foundation um, overall runs uh, slack that people can um, use to participate in the wider Apache community and not just the beam project right um, we have very specific um, channels there. Um, one area you're going to hear often, right, as Pablo just said, is the user and dev mailing list. Um, in the bottom of those links or, you know, sub bullet points or whatnot is even um, you can self subscribe, right? So um, grab some information there. Specifically, if you're a user and have some questions, check out um, the user mailing list. Hey, what's going on? Um, and development discussions. Hey, um, I'm thinking about this feature. I, I'd love it if it existed. Why can't someone build it for me? Maybe is one way to proceed, but as Pablo said, even better. Oh, I'd love this to exist. And I'm trying to make that happen. You know, will you guys, would you guys welcome that? At which point, almost certainly the community is going to be like, oh, yeah, sweet. We love, uh, you know, new people, and let's uh, let's get some cool stuff done. So um, check out those mailing lists, um, and then we got some more slides uh, next for some other bullet points. Um, okay, so those were largely uh, communication um, bits. We have a few more points here, but um, 
uh, bug reports are super valuable. Um, I mean, I guess can't say enough about contributions from just uh, concrete, repeatable, uh, here, I ran into this trouble, here's how, uh, here's how to repeat that so that that can be fixed. Even if you're not, you know, feeling confident in fixing the thing yourself, um, being able to concretely identify where the problems are is very valuable. Um, I mean, I don't even think we have on here, write some beam by getting involved, right? What is, uh, can this be used to solve a bunch of problems for you? If you're, you know, in the space and attending here, probably that is the answer to that question is yes. Um, yeah, examples, make it easy, share, um, talk to the people in your company, your friends, etc. cetera, right? Um, help grow this community. It's a very welcoming and open place. Um, Stack Overflow, uh, for those of you that are engineers, absolutely. Uh, ask your questions there. That stuff is indexed well, although so is the mailing list, but um, then, you know, for the usual Stack Overflow benefits. Um, the link here uh, takes, you know, it's like a bit.ly or whatever that will take you to JIRA, and there should be a list of tasks identified as starter tasks or newbie, or I think we have a bunch of different tags, but um, those should be if you want to get your hand, you know, hands on doing something, uh, there should be a bunch of tasks that are more tractable than others. Um, you know, even just make sure you, uh, uh, you know, have your machine set up properly and can do something small so that you can continue to feel like you're progressing and making steps in the direction that you want to. And naturally, a very advanced, uh, option, uh, add a connector for your favorite storage system or any other sort of feature. Um, I'd also add an echo public sentiments, very opening and welcoming community. You'll be able to handle, you know, what you need by through these various, uh, mechanisms of electronic communication. Um, I think I missed putting on here. There are from time to time things like, I'm putting on with a fellow beam uh, committer uh, at a conference in, I don't know, a couple months. Um, Jumpstart your open source journey uh, with Osmo. Uh, we have a, um, you know, here, this is not scary as much as it might seem to be. Just start the communication. I think you're hopefully seeing we're kind of reasonable, friendly people. Uh, you know, welcome. So um, I think that largely uh, wraps up the uh, what we're hoping to do here, setting the stage of, you know, welcome to the conference, welcome to the community. Uh, I think we have another presentation here in a little while from Tobias. Uh, what do we have? Um, yeah. So Look forward to that. I'm sure somebody else will introduce that in a minute. And we're otherwise uh, here to answer some questions or take a minute uh, for those on the you know, west coast of uh, the USA to you know grab a coffee and uh, wake up and strap in for a full day of uh, Beam Talks. Thanks, everybody. I've seen there are some questions that came in. Actually, maybe we can go through them. Um, I can start with the one I can answer, which is uh, how you can join the Beam Slack channel. There is a really easy way to do this, which is just Google Beam Slack channel, and it will take you to a page which uh, is hosted on the Beam website and says contact us. And if you scroll down, uh, you will see some of the channels that Austin actually just mentioned. So. Uh, the two mailing lists are there, the Jira tracker is there, um, some of the Stack Overflow links, and one of towards the end of the table that you will see there's a, a link that will take you to the Slack workspace, um, the Apache Slack workspace, in which we have a few channels that are related to Beam. So to reiterate, Google, um, either Google Beam Slack channel, Apache Beam Slack channel, 
or go to the website and check the community uh, contact us page. That will be the best way to get there. Um, I, I actually want to chime in there. The um, Googling the self-invite link for ASF Slack looks to not be up right now. There was a note in from ASF Infra that sometimes that breaks from time to time from updates, we'll say. Um, so at the risk of getting the user mailing list spammed, we have the ability to invite people uh, for anybody that's in there. So I'm going to suggest um, write the mailing list user at uh, beam.apache.org asking for an invite into the Slack. Um, we'll see how that goes, but uh, that gets that gets you in multiple means of communication and and whatnot. But um, people in the people already in there seem to have the ability to invite until Infras uh, fixes that. Bingo. Or try to link again tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd be another way to go. Um, for some of the other questions, um, I see a question, when are more IOs coming to Python? Um, and I guess I would ask, what IOs are you interested in? Um, we have, um, yeah, I, I think all the time we have people contributing things to Python and we're adding some native transforms that are written in Python and we're also adding support uh, for some transforms that exist in Java to be uh, made available in Python. Um, but it's so it helps us prioritize which ones we we want to invest in uh, with your feedback. So um, again, we're always adding new transforms and new IOs. Uh, but how we would know which ones to prioritize is with your feedback. So please, please tell us which ones you want. Um, there's also for schemas that change very frequently, is there any plan to handle that the structural changes in a more automatic way? Um, well, I this is there's no design document on this, uh, but as, as I was mentioning, I, this is something that I have thought about. Um, I think there's for schemas they they serve two purposes. So they on on the one side they serve uh, to do validations at, at pipeline. Uh, construction time, and there we can't have dynamic schemas. Uh, there we depend on, on some basic columns that we validate. And then they also serve uh, for encoding at, at pipeline runtime, right? And so for schemas that, that change over time, um, this will be kind of a, a, a runtime change. And so, um, so what I'm trying to say is, uh, we need to figure out where is the limit for these schemas, where for for this feature where um, we won't affect how they work uh, at construction time, and we will um, will enable schemas to change dynamically at runtime. But yes, uh, it's something that I'm that I'm thinking about and that I, I would like to add support for. Um, uh, there's another question. I'm not familiar with data stage, um, and. Uh, yeah, so um, um, yeah, so those are the questions that were shared with us. Does, are there any other questions from the audience? Um, all right, that's all. If there are no more questions, I guess we can we can wrap up for now, and um, we can see you in uh, in a few minutes for uh, Toby's talk. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. <laughs>